we really need to understand the impact that our gendered world is having on our brains. That very basis that we're looking at two different groups of individuals is, is in itself up for question. There's a long history of this idea of differences between male and female brains. It used to be thought um, that there were clear differences between males, the brains from males and the brains from females, even before people could actually look at brains. What they did was they looked at society as it was currently structured and they said that women are uh, socially inferior, educationally inferior, so let's find a way of explaining that and they focused on the brain. So the whole history of this has really been a, a hunt the differences saga. In the way people have been doing things backwards, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of science is about explaining the status quo, uh, which could be, you know, why is the sky blue, etc. So you take that as a given and then you work backwards looking for the explanation. And this is where this whole history of looking for differences between male and female brains has come from. Assuming that there were differences and let's find a way of finding them without challenging that basic assumption. And, and you, of course, you say there's a long history, so back in the 19th century there was this craze for phrenology, which was measuring, <laughs> me measuring bumps, bumps on the Bumps on the head, that's right. Well, there was two, two disciplines, if you like. Craniology, which was looking at the way in which the skull was structured. Some papers had that 5,000 different measurements at the angle between the jaw and the forehead and the nose, etc. And similarly with phrenology, feeling the skull, different bumps, which determined whether you were um, interested in justice and truth, or whether you were uh, maternally minded, or whether you were criminally minded. And so there was still this idea that we need to find a measure which will tell us why men's brains are different from women's brains. And, and did they find that? Oh, they were very good at finding it, actually. Yes, there was, um, they'd set up these wonderful metrics which would always somehow prove that men were superior. And when they were looking at women, they focused on those areas where they found a difference. And of course, techniques in neuroscience have, have moved on in leaps and bounds <laughs> in recent decades. So we have these wonderful images of the brain where different areas light up when you're thinking about different things. How has that changed the perception of sex difference. You started to get these wonderful images and all of a sudden it looked as though you know the invisible had been made visible. We could see where the brain was active and what the person was doing when the brain was active. So there was a lot of excitement associated um, with that. But the trouble is those images in themselves are actually the result of an assumption of a difference. So the images you see are actually this is a person not doing a memory task, this is a person doing a memory task, you subtract one from the other, and what you're actually looking at is the difference between those conditions. So if you're in an area where you're looking for differences, like males and females, then exactly the same principles were applied. And so what happened was that people were assuming there were differences and that's what they were looking for. Right, so we were having exactly the same problem of kind of retrofitting. Way, yes, yes, that's right. Yes, retrofitting is a good, good phrase. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. It started to engender big excitement in um, popular science because these images looked accessible. Mm -hmm. The story that you could spin around them was of interest to everybody because mm -hmm. everybody has a brain and a sex or gender of some kind, which is you know another whole issue. Um, and so people were really interested and people were saying here's the difference between a male brain and a female brain and this therefore explains you know, relationships, skills, education. It produced a big flurry of, of interest in this area. And those differences were undoubtedly there or at least they seemed to be on the brain scans but they were just a lot smaller or, or they just didn't tell you what what people claimed they were telling Yes, you. I think what people didn't communicate was that these differences are very tiny, very tiny, which in itself doesn't necessarily mean they're insignificant, but people didn't realise we're not looking at two completely different beings in terms of brains. And I think, I think that was quite important to realise. So it did look as though, you know, there were really two very different entities, a male brain and a female brain, and mm. from that everything else um, uh, emerged. <laughs> there is at least a widespread perception that there, there are differences in, in all sorts of things, you know, all the stereotypes like 
men can read maps, women can't park, yeah, <laughs> men right, yeah, can't yeah. multitask, yes. uh, women, are great at, women are great at empathy and intuition yes. in a way that men aren't. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the, the brain from the neuroscience perspective, are we saying that those, those differences just don't exist in the brain? And, and, and if so, where do they come from? Yeah. Or, or do they not exist, exist at anywhere. all? Yes, gosh. Um, and I'm not denying that there are differences between every brain. I think every brain is different from every other brain. And certainly with respect to some of the biological characteristics between males and females, anything associated with reproduction, um, you know, there are hormonal receptors in the brain. But even there, there are quite marked areas of overlap, much more than people realised. So they are there. But whether they're relevant to the differences you then talked about is a moot point. But it's also the case that now we're revisiting this, what I call the go-to list of stereotype differences between men and women, we're realising that actually those lists aren't really reliable. I think something like 20,000 studies, 12 million participants looked at well-known differences between male and female, and most of them disappeared or are disappearing or are vanishingly small. So that very basis that we're looking at to different groups of individuals is, is in itself up for, mm. you know, question. And oh, should we be surprised by this in a, in a world where we're, we're slowly, belatedly recognising that, um, that gender identity and even biological sex is not a binary thing? Mm. Well, I think, I think that's, that, that's a very interesting point in the 21st century. And I think it's very much to do with this whole idea that biological sex determines social gender. So there was an assumption that you, know, you were either male or female, and that meant you had a male or female brain, which meant that you had male abilities, female abilities, and that determined you know, your place in society. So you know, cutting the links between each of those is really where, what we should be doing now. But I think with respect to gender identity, we now know that one of the things our brain is really good at is making us a social being. We embed ourselves in social networks and our brain is a really powerful determinant of how we do that. And if the brain is collecting the information from the outside world that you know this is what a man does and this is what a woman does, but for some reason you're, you're not comfortable with that, the first thing that people look at is this biology gender link and they think, I don't feel like a man Therefore, there must be something wrong with my biology. So actually, if I change my biology, then I can be comfortable with that link. I think transgender individuals very often say, I feel, you know, I, I had a, you know, I was a female brain born into a male body, or I've been put in the wrong box. And what would be interesting now, I think, would be to actually challenge the idea of these boxes. So if we're saying that, that these differences between the sexes really don't exist or, or, a, or, a, or come more from cultural influ influences from our experiences, from our interactions with individuals. Why does that matter, that, that those differences don't exist mm. and yet the perception is that they do? Yeah, I think it matters a lot because I think, as I said, our brains are kind of out there trying to sort out the, you know, the social scripts for us. Um, and if the social scripts say, actually, you're a female, that means you're probably not that good at science. Science is not somewhere where females are comfortable. Um, you may go into science, but you know, you're not going to progress very far. Then actually that, that will determine the decisions that people make. That will determine how people educate them or employ them. And it will also determine their feelings about themselves. So this old nature versus nurture dichotomy, we need to get away from that because we really need to understand how the, the impact that our gendered world is having on our brain. But I think until we actually get rid of the idea that sex is an important differentiator and we should be looking at individual skills, I think we're going to get ourselves stuck in the same self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay.